Hello and welcome to The Dinosaur for week 31, another seven curious interesting things I saw last week. The first one has spiders in it by the way, so if you like to spiders, look away now. However, necrobiotics is a newly termed, I think, area of investigation for robotics. So this is from Rice University in Texas in America and they specialised in soft body robotics and research around that. When they were apparently clearing up some of their lab they noticed some dead spiders and thought, do you know what, this is exactly what we need and uh, put a needle into the back of one of them and reinflated the legs. So what you're seeing here is a spider's natural reaction to clamp its legs when it dies. This is a dead spider by the way. Uh, when you fill it full of air all of its hydraulics all kick off at the same time and then you can see it uh, grasping its, its arms open. So uh, what can you do with it? Well you can apparently do microelectronics and manipulation for small-scale medical things. That's apparently what they think it might be used for. Um, also it turns out that the bigger the spider then the less it can carry in ratio to its weight. So this might be seen in the future with small spiders doing very small things. The next thing they're going to try and do is try and get access to each one of the valves in each one of the legs. So as you see at the moment, all legs are going out at the same time when you inflate it and it's crunching back down with all legs at the same time. So uh, as soon as they can figure that out, then potentially they can also get it manipulating smaller interesting things and walking. So imagine super mini microcontrollers on a spider and it automatically using the spider as its sort of robot framework host. How creepy is that? That's amazing. Well done. Uh, Manchester City have a connected scarf or a smart scarf in old words. Uh, it uses a funny little connector, a little board full of stuff. Uh, that little board full of stuff has uh, skin temperature. I'm reading from the list, by the way. Skin temperature, it has movement, uh, it has heartbeat, and an EDA, which is an electrodermal activity monitor. So things like uh, when you get excited, your skin uh, can uh, conduct more electricity. So it's an approximation for excitement. So when a goal happens or when a, an important moment happens in the match, then obviously you'll be shaking your scarf. Uh, clearly uh, the whole point of it doesn't work at that point because you take it off your neck but should you just not do anything with your scarf then this is a brilliant idea so it's in conjunction with Cisco uh, one of the partners of Man City so this is really just a bit of a how can we work together to get some tech into this but it's a good piece of PR I saw it uh, interesting it's a little bit maybe three or four years uh, into the IOT stuff that you don't really need a transition but there you go. Uh, Man City have a connected scarf. Thought that was kind of interesting. Um, this is, uh, if you don't know, I have a, an information design history. That was my training back in the day at university. So every time I see an information design thing it usually gets me a bit interested. Now this is a really interesting example of using data to visualize how far you can get in Europe on a train within five hours. So uh, the outer limits of these little kind of spidery diagrams as you're seeing are where you can get in five hours and the so the contours are four, three, two, and one. Now this is called an isochrone. So if you're a town planner, then you probably know isochrones. It's basically where you can get to or what resources you can access within a certain um, distance from a location. So just thought it was really, really neat. Super, super simple, um, but a really good way of allowing people just to explore things like, well, which cities have the best or which countries like France is absolutely amazing. So if you're coming from Paris, Gare du Nord, then you can get to almost everywhere. Lots of places in London and the UK are really well connected. Other places aren't. So I just thought it was a really nice way of using data visualization and maps. So there you go. Uh, have a look at the URL. Um, this is uh, Damien Hurst. So Damien Hurst, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2016, created uh, 10,000 of these dot pictures. So uh, if you watch the video, he was really saying his, uh, his genesis for this was thinking about currency and how abstract currency is when you give somebody a note, uh, some sort of paper currency, it's a promise of something, it's the concept of it that only works in a structured society, et cetera, et cetera. So thinking like if he could create enough pa paintings to be the same as currency, how much would he need to do? So 10,000 is apparently what he came up with. So in 2016, and I guess um, throughout, he's been creating 10,000 of these. These have all been sold as, as NFTs, and then you had a choice, which uh, the choice is now come in, which is why I'm reporting on it. So the choice was uh, you own the you own the right to the painting as an NFT, but you need to choose one or the other. You either choose, I would like the physical version, in which case your NFT is then killed and you get the physical version, or you would like the NFT version, in which case he burns the physical copy of the artwork. So you only own 
which is again a piece of theatre and, and great reason to own an NFT because you own a part of the, the theatre of that as the NFT. However, the numbers are in, so uh, it's about 50-50, so 5,149 people chose to keep the real Damien Hurst, and 4,851 actually believe so much in NFTs that they wanted the original painting to be destroyed and the NFT to carry on. So there you go, really interesting. Have a look at uh, currency.nft.henny.com because uh, it's a really interesting site with some great videos and a great interview with Damien himself. So uh, I like that, it's interesting. TSB, uh, saw this on Twitter. So TSB, a lot of people have been locked out of their accounts this week. And a lot of people have also been screenshotting the error code that they got. So uh, we weren't able to do that is the error code. So no replicas, not enough good slaves to write. Nested exception is blah, 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 blah. So a lot of people going, what, sorry, not enough good slaves to write, what's going on there? So there has been a movement for the last couple of years. Uh, Twitter were really vocal in this a couple of years. And what I've uh, just copied below is, is Twitter's kind of, instead of using whitelist, use allow list. And instead of using master slave, please use lead follower, a primary replica, you know, that sort of thing. So there are better ways of writing the relationships with these things that we've been just basically using in code for a long, long time. So TSB did kind of two things a bit iffy. Clearly they didn't get the memo about in inclusive coding and use of inclu inclusive references within code and also in comments in code. Um, but also it's just a bit daft to actually show the actual uh, error to the end user. There's no need to do this. Um, there was a really good example a couple of years ago, uh, well actually a year ago, where a TV uh, had an error. And what they tried to do, instead of using a master and slave, they tried to use parent and child. And what it could do, it couldn't actually um, kill the, 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 the process. So basically it said cannot kill children in the actual code that it showed, which was another good example of why, A, not to use that sort of language, but also uh, just think ahead of how that might be uh, perceived if you show a data in the outside world. So if you're still not on the the world of um, inclusive coding and terminology, then uh, here's a good example of how it can go horribly wrong. There you go. Uh, this is from MIT and uh, very exciting actually. This is a, another medical thing. Uh, this is using ultrasound attached to the skin. So normally if you go in for an ultrasound, you have a huge amount of equipment and there's that funny little wand thing and they put on the goop with the gel and they squish it around a little bit and you're only really, you know, you're there as long as the operator is there for as well. It's a hugely expensive thing to do. And now this is a wear wearable ultrasound device. So that little square there has lots of little sensors in it that can actually project the ultrasound into the skin and can direct it, which is really important so that you can focus it on certain layers and you can also direct it around to look at different things. So these are actual images from that ultrasound sensor that is stuck to the skin. It can stay on the skin for about 48 hours. Um, it does currently need to be wired into something. They showed how you can do that with 3D printing of uh, connections. However, the next uh, idea of this is it stays on the skin, but it then can be wired wireless into a device. So you can work for 48 hours. Now this is uh, somebody's neck apparently, um, or this is a cartoid, uh, this is in the neck, so it's a, uh, a vein um, or an artery. Um, imagine if you have something wrong with your heart or you have some cartilage issues, something like that, and you actually need to see it in use. Uh, also for sports therapy, this will be amazing. So this is probably going to be coming to a watch near you. Um, <laughs> but then I was thinking about that, thinking why would you need to see inside your wrist? But imagine if it's a, uh, a phone connected thing that you can sense and it'll just tell you what's going on with your heart, your liver, your all sorts of things. So I thought it was really interesting uh, development uh, in wearables. And finally, uh, I don't know whether you remember that guy who accidentally threw out his hard drive with 8,000 bitcoins on it back in 2013. So he mined them, had two, two hard drives, and threw out accidentally the wrong one. It went into a rubbish dump uh, somewhere in Wales and would ideally like it back because now, although Bitcoin is now probably a third of what it was a couple of months ago or six months ago, it's still worth 156 million pounds on that hard drive somewhere in this grassed over dump. So this used to be a landfill site and is now being grassed over. Um, so the council do not want you to go messing around and digging this up because there are gases that come out of these things. It's environmentally environmentally sensitive. Uh, so they, they've got no interest in this, but um, James Howells, who was the person who owned the hard drive has now got a plan, a dastardly plan. This is a VC backed plan for nine million pounds worth of funding to use six months of time to go in, into this dump and then roughly where, they know roughly where the hard drive might be. So to dig it through using AI to look at the conveyor belt of rubbish and real people. Also saying they were gonna use Boston Dynamics dogs as guard dogs. So I think they were just slightly over egging it to make it a bit more of a story. Uh, there's another plan I think for 18 months that would take uh, a little bit less money. Um, however, 
Uh, the council are saying absolutely no. There's really no interest. He's even said he'll split the money with the council to a certain extent. But uh, the VCs who are behind this, are obviously, they're just looking for a split of the money as well. It seems like a, an interesting um, bet. Uh, there you go. So um, at the moment, it's going nowhere. But uh, what is that now? Nine years later, it's still going on. Anyway, hopefully that was interesting, uh, quite eclectic this week. Hopefully it was useful. If you did, give it a like, maybe a comment, and definitely share it with somebody lovely. So I will see you next week.